Hello, everybody. It's Clear Vision Wednesday time. I'm Claudia Mühlenweg. I am the creator of the Natural Clear Vision Method and a holistic vision teacher. And I realize my hoodie is all messed up. Welcome, welcome to today's presentation. And um, oops, let me make sure my YouTube sound is off. So I'm super excited to share my presentation today. And this is something that we don't hear a lot about, right? We talk a lot about eye foods and, you know, I have picked carrots in that picture for a reason because carrots are considered the superfood for vision. It's still a myth that's floating around and carrots are not bad. I'm not saying they're bad. And they have beta carotene and that converts to vitamin A, which helps, helps with night vision. But this whole myth was born in the second world war with British fighter pilots. So they basically made up a whole story how carrots are the best thing, that superfood. And for some reason, and Bugs Bunny wasn't helping, right? If you're as old as I am, um, we, we all grew up with Bugs Bunny eating carrots. And um, I think Popeye with the spinach was actually a little bit closer to the real solution for good foods for your eyes. But so let me share, I have a screen show presentation for you prepared. And let me share my screen so that you guys can see this. Let me just find all the different buttons here. Make sure I have the right one. So you should be able to see my screen. Oops, let me get rid of the little Zoom. Zoom always puts all these different panels somewhere. All right, so I will, since this is live, I will play my presentation and you should see it full screen now. So, and I call this the silent vision killer and you will hear about why I call it that, how even healthy, and I put eye foods like carrots again as that example can contribute to eye disease. And before we get into the, to the presentation, I want you to remember that I am not a doctor. I'm not replacing traditional vision care. I'm not a dietitian. I'm a natural vision improvement um, coach. And I have over um, almost 15 years of experience with this work and have done lots of research and also from my own health journey. So I'm sharing that from this background and not from being a medical doctor. So I really want you to consider that if you have any eye diseases, please, 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 um, check with your eye doctor and have them actually, you know, take care of you. So that's something I really want to make sure that you understand. So let's look at some statistics here. So 34.2 million people or 10.5% 10 of the U.S. population have diabetes. And with those over the age of 65, it's a whopping 26.8%. Um, and a lot of um, people that with diabetes are like, like me are over 60. So it's a really important factor to consider if you're in that age group, right? And where the eye doctor usually tells you, oh, you know, it's normal at your age, it's common, it's normal to get these problems. Um, and I have, I can also share links later about these um, statistics. And then also look at pre-diabetes, right? 96 million people of America, in America have, and that's more than one in three people have pre-diabetes. And you will see how pre-diabetes you don't even have to have prediabetes or diabetes to be um, diagnosed with eye diseases. So that, that's a pretty scary statistics. And the crazy thing about this, it's completely, and I'm not talking about diabetes, juvenile diabetes, diabetes one, but I'm really talking about diabetes two, which is 100% lifestyle related. And no matter what your genetics are, you can do something about it. And this is really important slide too, because people with diabetes, they realize, yeah, it could maybe lead to heart attacks or stroke, or maybe, you know, we've heard all had of people getting their toes or their limbs amputated, but a lot of people don't think about eye diseases. Obviously, diabetic retinopathy at the, that you see in that orange box there, it's already named diabetic retinopathy, but cataracts and glaucoma, right, are huge, very much related to blood sugar imbalances, and we will get more into that in a moment, that it doesn't have to be full-blown diabetes. And another thing I want to say here, very often, these problems like diabetes get actually diagnosed by an eye doctor because the eyes are often the very first organ that shows issues when even your fasting blood sugar might be normal and you don't have any idea what something is going on. So, so basically, this is the other thing. Diabetes-related eye diseases are the leading cause of blindness in adults ages 20 to 74. So this is something that people don't think about, you know, like I don't have diabetes, I don't have any problems. And then you get that diagnosis from your eye doctor. So if you have diabetes, you have 40% higher chance to develop glaucoma, 60% higher chance to develop cataracts. And of course, like I said, diabetic retinopathies. 
which is the leading cause of preventable blindness. And other retinal diseases such as macular edema are also related to diabetic changes in the body, macular degeneration, all, most pretty much all eye diseases have some kind of component related to this. So this is a, this is a graphic that describes a little bit of the difference, what happens norm, on the left is a normal eye, and on the right, you see, this is already an advanced stage of diabetic retinopathies, but you see all these different things. You see the retinal detachment, hemorrhages, and the, these little blood vessel blockages. You see these, um, these, there's an aneurysm down there where you see, see there's something completely blocked. And what does the blood vessels do when they're blocked? They're growing these tiny, tiny, flimsy new blood vessels so that you get this growth of additional blood vessels that, are, that actually end up bleeding into the retina because they are like a, you know, like a water garden hose that's just really fray and old and eventually they, they, they leak, right? So basically um, these are all related to these, these eye diseases. It's, and also the, um, the swelling in the macula, that's an, another sign. Um, whatever, these cotton wool spots, they call them cotton wool spots. Fluffy, that those are fluffy white spots that pop up. Um, that's also related to high blood pressure, by the way. And a lot of these, like, a lot, like let me look at my notes, what I else wanted to say. So basically, um, so the lens, right? The lens that you see in that little blue circle there or oval, um, that's based in wa uh, water and proteins. And the proteins are kind of stacked in a perfect order. And when you have high blood sugar, which is obviously a problem in diabetes, you know, from sugar or sweetness and other things we will talk about today, they kind of clump up, these proteins clump up and create that cloudiness that's known as cataracts. And it all leads to inflammation, oxidative stress from free radicals. And that's why I'm saying AMD, age-related macular degeneration, cataracts, glaucoma, macular edema are all precursors to diabetic, diabetic retinopathies. All right, so let's look at, so this is basically, this is a picture of somebody with a cataract, and you might have seen that also in animals like dogs, older dogs, where you basically see that the, you know, it's not black inside the eye, but it has that kind of cloudiness. This is a very advanced cataract in this picture. And then you, you know, this is what drives me personally nuts. People are like, yeah, I have an early cataract, you know, but the doctor said I'm 65, that's just normal. That's what they tell you. Because, and the only reason that is normal or common is because the majority of people in our modern, and I put that in quotation marks here, Western society eat a diet full of sugar, toxins, preservatives, highly processed foods, and they're full of inflammatory seed oils that causes all these diabetes re related issues. And it's really not somebody's age as their lifestyle and their diet that eventually catches up with their bodies and especially their eyes. So I want to tell you a little story. So I had a woman call me from Germany a few days, a few days, a few years ago. And I was talking to her and she said she was in her early 40s and she was diagnosed with early stage cataracts. And I said, well, that's, you know, that's even for eye doctors, that's really young. Do you have that in your family? Is there any genetics, anything? Like she said, no, nope, we don't have that in the family. So I started asking her about her blood sugar. I'm like, what, like, is there anything wrong with your blood sugar levels? She said, yes, the doctor told me I have pre-diabetes, but I have nothing to worry about. And that's what I'm, why I'm doing this video right now, because you have everything to worry about. And this would be the moment. And she decided not to work with me. And I don't know, maybe she changed her diet. I don't know. But this is the kind of scenario where I'm like, you have everything to worry about. So don't listen to your doctor when they tell you these things. So, and like I said earlier, diabetes, diabetic changes in the eyes are often diagnosed by an eye doctor or in the, your body, right? Doing one of those dilated pupil eye exams, right? The ones where we get atrophy into our eyes and they dilate the pupil and it's really annoying, but that's the best way to actually look at your retina and to actually see what's going on in, with your eyes. And even when your annual blood work, right? Maybe you go, you get your blood drawn once a year and all your fasting blood sugar levels are great. And everything like, you know, the lab report says normal, normal, normal in all the rows, all the categories, right? And here's this, another story I wanna tell you. So this was not my client, but this was a client of one of my mentors, um, Dr. Rita Maria Scalzo. And she had a story that she shared where, so she, she signed up for Dr. Rita Marie's blood sugar balancing course because her husband, husband has diabetes. So she bought the course and she happened to go to the eye doctor at the same time. 
And the eye doctor said, you know, you really got to get your diabetes under control. And she said, wait a moment, I don't have diabetes. You're, conf you're confusing me with my husband. He said, no, you have diabetes. I can see that in your eyes. So the eye doctor wrote a nice letter to her family, you know, her, um, what do you call it? Uh, family medicine or her regular doctor saying, please, you know, do something. Um, here's my client. You need to put her on metformin or some other, other diabetes, you know, medication. And she went to the doctor, to her regular doctor, and the doctor said, no, your labs are fine. You don't need any diabetes medication. So basically completely ignored what the eye doctor saw in the eyes, right? Isn't, doesn't that drive you nuts? I mean, so <laughs> let's look at some statistics here, some numbers actually, because you might know what your blood sugar is. And here's the thing, our healthcare system is so broken because what your lab result states as normal right? You've all seen that on your lab result, normal. It's based on the average of all people taking these labs, let's say in the United States. In other words, the span of what is considered is okay is based on a population where 30% of people are diabetic. What you really want to set is, you know, to see for the normal A1C and the A1C, by the way, that's your average, that first kind of traffic light on the left, that's basically your average blood glucose from the last three months. So they do this, it's called HbA1c. And that's what you can see. That's when my mom tells me, my sugars are like six, five. The doctor has said, I'm okay. I'm like, oh, you're not really okay. But basically what you really want to see, look at the green, right? The normal, the ideal. You actually want to see ideally something under five. If you really want to look at, if there would be another like arrow with that, that would say optimal, it would be under five but you really wanna be under 5.7. Um, and what they call pre-diabetes and diabetes, that is really, that's basically what they balance you to when you take metformin, they keep you around that, that level, but it, that's already causing all this damage to your vision, right? And so when you look at fasting blood sugar, you know, you know if you've ever done a lab test, you know, 99, they say normal, and then you add a hundred and boom, it says high. As if, you know, <laughs> Sorry, 99 is way too high for fasting blood sugar. It should be like 85 or lower if, if you were looking at optimal. Um, and then same for glucose tolerance test. And honestly, I'm curious if you're watching live, like who has ever done a glucose tolerance test? The only time I've ever done this in my whole life was when I was with my two pregnancies, right? When you're pregnant, they give you this, you chuck down a liter of glucose water and they test your blood sugar and they kind of look at that. But most people have never, ever done this glucose tolerance test. They only look at fasting blood sugar and the A1C even, you know, unless you're already diabetic, if you get your, if you're like on normal health insurance, they don't even include that. You have to ask for that. But when, once you're diabetic, once your fasting blood sugar is over 126, then the labs include that. But you really, when, if you get your lab done, do the A1C because that gives you really, really good data, what's actually going on, because it shows you the average of your blood sugar, right? So that's really important. And also obviously understanding what these labs mean. So working with a functional medicine doctor, you know, because a lot of times your regular doctor will consider everything that looks normal. And again, based on that average population normal, and they will never help you to get to an optimal state of health. And this is another thing. Diabetic retinopathies develop at pre-diabetic blood sugar levels. And just like Diane, right, up to 13% of people that are diagnosed with diabetes um, that is related to all these eye diseases have even fasting, normal fasting blood sugars under 100, right? So if you go to, if you measure your fasting blood sugar, maybe you have a, you prick your finger or maybe you go to the doctor and they say, oh, you're 99 you could already have diabetic changes in your eyes and you have no clue because you don't really notice that initially. And here's the other thing, only 60% have those slightly elevated numbers up to 120, which is that pre-diabetes state, like that woman from Germany that called me, she already had cataract and she was in that pre-diabetes stage where the doctor says, you have nothing to worry about. So, so here are the stages to diabetes. And then the thing is, it can take 30 years this is another thing that drives me personally nuts where they say, you're normal, you're okay. Boom, you have diabetes. I'm like, oh, really? That happened overnight? Like a heart attack? Heart attack also does, doesn't happen overnight. It takes decades to lead up to that event where your body is finally like that water hose that's finally, you know, exploding because it's, it's just too thin. So all this stuff takes decades to happen. And that's the same with eye disease. They don't happen overnight. 
And they don't happen because you magically turn 60 or 65. They happen because of, of all the stuff you've been doing all these years prior to this. So, um, so how do you know if you have any of these problems, right? If your fasting blood, blood uh, glucose is maybe even like mine under 90 and you don't know anything unusual, right? And maybe I never did an A1C test until I learned all about this. I had no idea. Everything was normal for me. And thankfully, I actually don't have cataracts or any eye diseases yet. But let's look at the stages. So hyperinsulinemia, that means that the amount of insulin in your blood is higher than what's considered normal. So that's the first stage. And nobody really tests that unless you do insulin testing, which you don't do if you don't have any problems. Then the second stage is reactive hypoglycemia. So hypo means lower, right? That means when you're after eating, which is called postprandial, it means after you eat meal, right? If your blood sugar is going too low after you eat, right? Where you drop too low, where you might get dizzy or faint or something. And that is usually within the four hours after eating a meal. And that is different from generally having a healthy low blood sugar level, right? Which is what you want. But this is when you like, for instance, let's say you're fasting, your blood sugar will be really low, but that's different. This is like a reactive hypoglycemia means after a meal, your blood sugar drops so low that you don't feel well. And then the next level is what I had when I, and I'll tell you more about this in a moment, insulin resistance. And that's when cells in your muscles, your fat and your liver don't respond, respond well to insulin. And they can't easily take up glucose from your blood raising your, your postprandial, you know, that after the meal blood sugar too high. So when you get those spikes, but you, you don't necessarily, I didn't feel anything different. I didn't feel like, and I can tell you a little bit more later, but other than having those cravings for carbs and sugar, but I didn't really feel anything. And then the next stage is metabolic syndrome. And you might've heard of that. So met metabolic syndrome includes high blood pressure, high blood sugar, excess body fat around the waist and abnormal cholesterol levels. The syndrome increases a person's risk for heart attack and stroke. So that's kind of basically the level before. And then obviously you could say technically pre-diabetes and diabetes, right? So here are some pictures of me. And, and I really don't like sharing these pictures because that was showing me at my highest level of, I think I was honestly, I can't remember, 180 pounds or something. And one of those, and the reason I started working with Dr. Rita Marie and changing my life around is because she talked about the symptoms. She talked about the symptoms of insulin resistance, which were belly fat, right? Brain fog, that afternoon slump when you're like, you just, your head drops down on the desk because you're so tired. And I definitely had that belly fat that kind of started creeping up with me suddenly in my mid forties, you know, you gain these extra pounds and you tell yourself, you know, it's okay. At least I don't look so wrinkly. You know, I made all these excuses and I felt okay. Only when I looked at the pictures, I was like, oh man, I look really chubby these days. Right. And this is what they also say. Oh, you know, your, meta your metabolism just changes when you get into your fifties and menopause. And it's just, you know, that's why it's, it's just okay to gain some weight. So, um, oops. Um, let's see. Um, I think this slide is actually in the wrong place. So, um, so this is basically what I, you know, this is kind of the meals I was eating back then. And I thought I was eating really healthy. You know, after all, I ate a salad several times a week. I had, um, you know, I had a vet, a turn, had become a vegetarian during my vision teacher training in 2009. And these were some typical meals I ate back then. And I drank carrot juice pretty much every morning. And I ate my favorite spinach salad that had uh, mangoes, black beans, quinoa, and olive oil. And then that's the, what you see next to the carrot juice picture there. So um, here's a picture of me and Dr. Rita Maria. I already alluded to that, that you know she helped me change my life around. And really because she talked about the symptoms that I had. And I ended up losing those extra 50 pounds that I had accumulated in my 50s. Um, yeah, pretty much mostly in my 40s and 50s. And my vision cleared up beyond what I had accomplished with the Bates method. My energy became boundless. My brain fog was gone. And my mental focusing abilities were restored to my younger self. Like I didn't feel that, you know, that afternoon slump was gone. And even my blood pressure, which had kind of slowly crept up to often sometimes 150 or 95, which, and again, I have that in my genetics. My mom has high blood pressure. And so I do have pretty poor genetics in that regard. 
But after checking and, and realizing what, what's wrong with my blood sugar, my blood um, pressure also went back down to 120 or 80, kind of my the normal levels that I used to always have my whole life. And, um, and here's the thing, my mom kept saying, you know, there's nothing you can do. You turn 50 and your blood pressure will go up and you can't change anything. And, um, and that's why she's on beta blockers and metformin. And I'm like, no, 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 I know I can do something. But at the same time, my numbers weren't, you know, and I didn't measure my blood glucose back then, but I measured my blood pressure. And I, you know, I kind of lied to myself. I'm like, ah, I can do something. But when I, whenever I did check my blood pressure, it was, it was not always great. It was sometimes pretty high, like that 150 to 95. So I was like, hmm, but I know I had to do something. So and when I met Dr. Rita Marie, I got serious about this even though I didn't have any, you know, eye diseases, I didn't, other than the belly fat and the symptoms, I really didn't have, you know, some of the things that people, basically I was taking it at a stage where it was smart and easy to reverse while just waiting until I had all these problems, um, you know, and I had, I had a big why I wanted to make those changes and they really went beyond my belly fat. So, um, so I started following Dr. Rita Marie's advice. I'd stopped eating sugar completely. Um, we will talk more about that in a moment. And the single biggest change that I made was this. I started, I got one of those little blood glucose meters. You can get them at Walmart for nine bucks. And I started testing my blood glucose before and after meals to see how different foods affected my blood sugar. And I learned a lot from that. And again, conventional medicine thinks it's okay going up to 140 after a meal is eaten, uh, even higher but normal doesn't mean optimal. So Dr. Marita Marie advised me to really try and especially to do a so-called metabolic reset where we don't want the, the blood sugar levels after eating to go off after over 110, right? And that is, I think, 6.1 in the, what the Europeans or the Canadians would use. So we, I really worked really hard on keeping my levels very, very, you want your blood sugar to be like, the flatlands of, you know, you don't want it to be the mountainous range. You want your blood sugar levels to be really balanced. And so, and one of my favorite foods, like the carrot juice, right? That salad suddenly was a no-no for me. And I used to eat, you know, my, um, my, my morning meal was usually oatmeal with, um, with berries. And I, and I checked for my usual portion that I ate and my blood sugar went almost up to 200. And same with that salad, that spinach, mango, quinoa, black bean salad, my blood glucose went to 180 or something. It went really, really high. And, and most grains and legumes really raised my blood sugar super high and fruit also. Um, so I changed, started changing it. I replaced oatmeal with chia pudding. I ate a lower amount, like I ate, still ate fruit, but less of it until I was at that level where I could, you know, and I tracked everything. I tracked everything I did. And my, it took a month and my, my metabolism was completely reset. And then I was slowly able to add some of those food bags back in at, again, lower levels. Some foods I still cannot really eat. They still raise my blood sugar really high, but maybe I can have one piece of pineapple, right? Or maybe two pieces. So, um, so this is the trick here that I recommend to do. Start measuring your blood glucose before and after eating a meal and track, and track what you ate and write it down. I mean, it takes a little bit of work but it really gets you a good idea because here's the thing. We are all different. And my sister joined me and um, she started doing the same thing and she could eat. I can remember, let's say a whole banana and I could not, but I could eat something and it raised her blood sugar. So we're all different, even with similar genetics. And what I really like about um, avoiding and I, what I really got me interested is that I knew that diabetes was the leading cause of blindness and being a vision teacher, I really realized how important it is to educate people on food and not just, you know, follow the 10 superfoods that everybody recommends. So the so-called, like I said that a few times, the postprandial again means after eating a meal. So the postprandial blood glucose outweighs fasting blood glucose and even that average HbA1c, that average blood glucose, right, in screening for coronary heart disease. So really getting and, and I know you have to prick your fingers but I will give you some other options in a moment but it really really is important to get an idea what actually happens after eight meals and um, there's other things that affect your blood glucose levels like sleep how much you exercise 
your stress levels. So it's not just the food. And I know I experienced that myself because I had a very dramatic um, challenge with my family doing that metabolic reset. And that high level of stress that really worry about my family got to the point where even when I was literally just eating spinach, for example, and I wasn't just doing that, but my blood glucose was still going over 110. So I personally know that stress has a huge impact on that as well. But overall, if you're not in extreme panic stress mode, the diet for me was the biggest driver of my blood glucose levels. But I'm not saying that it's the only one. It's really important. Your mindset, you know, your sleep, all these other factors that, and, and, and the exercise. Exercise also helps you lower your blood glucose. So definitely not the only thing, but we're focusing on food right now. And it has a really, really, really big, big impact on that. And for me, with a family history of heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and cancer, I really realized that I need to take this more seriously. If I want to kick in, want to kick it in my 90s and beyond, which I totally plan on doing, right? So I'm not going to plan to be the grandma sitting in a chair, nodding, knitting socks or and wearing thick glasses or having cataract surgery. That's really or being on all these medications that people take, which is really, I am proud to not be on any medications and I never have been on any medications. And, and I want the same for you. So here are some additional tips um, beyond like what foods you eat exist, uh, what you eat exists uh, exactly at space meals, 46 hours, 46 hours apart. So this was a huge issue for me. Who like, I would like to know, and maybe put that in the chat, were you told that you have to eat five meals a day? That's how, what I, when I grew up, that's what they told you. Nothing could be farther from the truth. It's, and I, that's what I'm saying. Like my blood glucose spiked so high and then it crashed. So it was kind of the hypoglycemia after eating a meal. And then I craved, I had to eat some snack. Like two, one to two hours after eating a meal, I was hungry again. I was like, I'm hangry. Yeah, it's, I need to eat something. And that already is an issue. It's almost like weaning a baby, you know, where you like get them to space the breastfeeding further and further apart. So initially I maybe lasted, I made it like two hours and then I made it three hours. And initially, and then finally, I got to the part um, to the part where I was able to, to have at least four hours between a meal. And the last meal should be a minimum of three hours before bed. That's something I'm still at times struggling with, to be honest. I'm totally honestly here. Um, sometimes that, you know, late nights, you know, where you eat a meal and then you eat a little bit too late and you want to go to bed. So for best sleep, for recovery and sleep, you don't want to eat anything three hours before bedtime. And here's the biggest driver. This is really key. 12 hours between dinner and breakfast. And for me, I was never a breakfast person. Even as a, even as a kid, I never liked eating breakfast. So I'm, I stopped eating breakfast. And Dr. Vidam said, it's totally fine. And I was like, oh my God, I have permission to skip breakfast. And I'm not, it's not the most important meal of the day, what they tell you. No, it's not. I was never hungry in the morning anyway. And so getting to that 12 hour fasting gap was really way easier for me when I skipped breakfast. And by the way, if you drink coffee, if you put any milk or sugar or whatever in it, then you are already interrupting your fasting. So I switched to drinking black coffee in the morning, even though I really like my cappuccino with almond sugar-free almond milk much more, but because black coffee or tea doesn't interrupt your fasting. So, and it's even better if you get 16 hours and something I don't have in this presentation, I want to share with you right now, so there's exciting research that I, I learned from Dr. David Sinclair of the um, Harvard Institute. He wrote, wrote a book called Lifespan. And he talked about um, research that shows that what we call this intermittent fasting, but fasting for 12 or more hours um, between meals, ideally 16 to 14 or 16 hours, actually they were able to reverse age-related macular degeneration. So if you're listening to this and you have macular degeneration or any retinal issues, Stop eating those snacks, stop eating, like really get to the point, you know, slowly, slowly train yourself to have at least 12 hours between the last meal and the first meal. And again, you know, coffee and all those, if you put creamer and stuff that already disrupts your fasting, that will really help you. And I will dig more into that research. But when I heard that, I was so excited about um, how helpful the fasting it is, it really helps you on so many levels, your blood pressure, your blood glucose overall feeling healthier, aging, declining, you know, stopping down the aging, the clock, the chronological clock, 
uh, no, the biological clock, not the chronological clock. You can't stop that one. <laughs> um, but you can definitely be younger than your years with fasting. And then slowly, eat slowly. And I don't know about you guys, but I definitely, you know, everybody in my family ate fast. So chew well. Digestion, digestion starts in the mouth. Chewing well, taking your time is really important also for, for overall health and blood sugar balance. And then practicing relaxation before meals. You know, maybe you said, say a prayer before meals. Maybe you sit down, you take a few breaths and you appreciate the meal. Like to just kind of, you know, the worst thing, and I used to do that too, you know, eating, you know, at the computer. So if you're working in an office, go outside if the weather is nice, take a break, get away from your desk, you know, sit somewhere nice or go to a restaurant. I mean, restaurants is another story, but don't sit at your desk and walk through lunch. Really important to take your time and then really stay away from those seed oils. You've probably heard about them. Canola oil, rapeseed oil, sunflower oil, soybean oil, safflower oil. All these oils are really contributing to inflammation. And so when you look for your, for your pasta sauce, you will see even at Trader Joe's, I was shocked not a single one doesn't have sugar or oil in it. They all have sugar. They all have oil in them. So I do... I personally eat just a very small amount of olive oil. I take the carbon 60, which comes in olive oil or um, MCT oil, but I don't use oil for anything else. And maybe coating my iron skillet, but I don't, you know, I don't pour all oil over my salads. That's another thing I'm not gonna get into today, but you really wanna ex limit your exposure to oil. It's already a processed food. So, um, so this is basically, I, I talked about that earlier. So the slides were out of order. I apologize for that. But basically, this is um, the causes of insulin resistance and diabetes is genetics. It is inadequate uh, nutrition. This is the main focus of this presentation. It is stress. So stress, as all of you that do already vision improvement know, it's super important to stay in a relaxed state unless you have to be stressed for some kind of reason to run away from danger or something like that. But stress is so chronic now, and that will also... Um, create that um, insulin resistance, the precursor to diabetes, the lack of exercise. And it doesn't mean you have to go into the gym every day for hours, even just doing some like 30 second to one minute little bursts of exercise, like jumping in place, jump rope, or, you know, any of those kind of things where you get your heart rate up a couple of times of a day will already, excuse me, help you. And then obviously sleep. Sleep is very important. And now we have all these cool devices like Apple Watches, Aura Rings, um, all these different devices that really help you, you know, to monitor your sleep and to see what you're doing. And you notice when you don't eat night right before bed, your heart rate variability will be better. All your stats will be better when you when you eat, when you balance your blood sugar, and when you do that little bit of intermittent fasting. And so these are the five most important lab tests. When you get your next time you get your labs drawn. And honestly, I, I don't even have a doctor here in the United States. I do everything online. And it depends if you live in New York, I don't think you can do that. But in most states, you should be able to either ask your doctor and maybe pay out of pocket. But most lab tests are not that crazy expensive. So if your doctor says, well, that's not covered by your insurance because you don't have diabetes, just say, can you please test it anyway? And then let me know how much and you pay. You know, maybe it's, it's, it's not that much money. You can find out. Fasting glucose is usually included, but fasting insulin is not included. Triglycerides is usually included. The HDL, the bad cholesterol is usually also included, but the HB1C is usually not included. So that's really a good one to get. And then, um, so th this is basically when you have insulin resistance, right? So some of these things that come with that might are, you know, basically you also prolong you know, the, you inhibit fat burning, right? And who wants that? We all want to burn fat. So if you have insulin receptor resistance, like I did, you, you don't burn fat. So I was trying all these diets and I was trying these things where I didn't eat sugar for two months or I didn't eat, drink alcohol at all, which I don't do much anymore. But if you, so I tried all these things, I exercised like crazy, nothing worked because I had that high, that not regulated blood sugar. So excess belly fat definitely was my case decreased lean muscle mass. You do the damage to the blood vessel linings, which is clearly uh, seen in the eyes. Um, systemic inflammation throughout your body, arthritis, you know, all these autoimmune diseases can often trace, be traced back to the high the, the, um, blood sugar issues, high blood pressure, 
Water retention, if you ever have that kind of swollen feet or swollen legs or something, could obviously be related to kidneys, but blood sugar imbalances or insulin receptor resistance is often a root cause of this. Development, obviously, of all these diabetic and all these other eye diseases, initiation of cancer through oxidative damage and the IGF-1 hormone, thyroid and growth hormone deficiency. So a lot of thyroid issues are related to blood sugar imbalances, increased cancer risk, well, high blood pressure is double or twice on the slide. I guess I, it doesn't hurt to say it again. Risk of Alzheimer's and dementia and low energy in organs and glands. So all these things are related. So obviously, if you look at this slide, you would be like, well, duh, you know, the right picture is better for the eyes, right? That's, that's obvious. We all know that. But um, here's the thing. The sugar is hidden in so many forms, right? This is, we all, this is sugar. We know that, right? But sugar is also, is also this. Sugar is also this. And you, that's what raised my blood sugar really high. This is sugar is also this, right? That it doesn't mean that sugar is in the, maybe even if it isn't in the pasta sauce or the, but the, those carbs, you, for me at least, they really raised my blood sugar super high. And even like this, what I was sharing with you earlier. So my, my daily um, oatmeal or oats with berries, they were, they're also sugar because they raised my blood sugar really high in my body and because that I react, reacted to that. And, right, so oatmeal is definitely a, a better choice for breakfast than those donuts or all those sweet things. When you, when you go to Starbucks and you see, or when you go to shopping carts, you see sometimes when, what people eat. And I used to do that, right? I used to eat like, you know, bread rolls for breakfast, pasta for lunch, pizza for dinner, right? There's not a single single vegetable in there. And obviously that's better, but added sugar is hiding in 40, 74%. Isn't that crazy? Of all packaged foods, 74% of all packaged foods that you buy in the supermarket has hidden sugar in it. And it's not just, we know ketchup, but you probably know ketchup, tomato sauce, right? But it's in savory foods too, and soups and salad dressings and pretty much all beverages except water. And you know, and this is the thing, sugar, there's over 60, it's probably more than this, but so many things when you, when, if you're somebody like me who starts reading ingredient labels, sometimes I have to Google it because I really don't know what that means. It has all these different names. So the manufacturer, and then they call it all natural, all natural or sugar free. And then they still have sugar hidden in there with other names. It's crazy what is allowed to, for, for all these manufacturers to put in there. You know, so you might be like, well, Claudia, what were you able, what could you still eat? Like, right? It sounds like every, all these foods were raising your blood sugar. So, right? So high glycemic foods like banana, pineapple, grapes, papaya, mangoes, and starchy foods like rice, grain were definitely for me a no-no in the very beginning. And when I really, when I did that metabolic reset where I kept my postprandial blood sugar under 110, I didn't eat any of these foods, right? Now I'm eating them again, but I'm also not eating a whole pineapple in one go, for instance, right? I'm eating maybe a slice or so. Um, and so who knew that these, you know, superfoods can affect us so negatively, right? Here's the good part. You can still eat uber delicious meals that keep your blood sugar balanced. You just need to make some food swaps. And simple food swaps include changing traditional pasta. So I'm using zucchini, kelp. They have edamame noodles or they have these konjac noodles, which I had never heard about before I met Rita Marie. They uh, were introduced to America by, I forgot the guy's names, but they are Japanese food and they're called, they're made from konjac, which is a plant. And the brand name originally was Miracle Noodles. They're also called shirataki noodles. So they're, they're, they're swimming in a little bit of water, but they really, they don't have any taste. And I basically, and they have only 10 calories for a whole serving of, of those, of that kind of pasta with those contract noodles. So those are great ways to swap. Like me, I swap the oatmeal for chia pudding. Chia, I do a pudding with chia, flax seed, hemp seeds, really high in omega-3s, which are important for eye health. So that's easy to do. Instead of wheat or flour tortillas, you can do jicama. Trader Joe's sells these little jicama tortillas, um, you know, really great. I use small romaine lettuce, right, for like tacos, endive leaves. So there's always easy ways to swap. You can swap sugary chocolate to either 100% black 
or you can sweeten it to chocolate that is sweetened with a little bit of monk fruit or stevia. I prefer unsweetened chocolate now. You can, instead of wheat crackers, you can eat flax seed crackers. There's a brand called Flackers. I'm not associated with them. And you can um, switch sugary yogurts to homemade yogurts, right? Not yogurts, vegetable yogurts. And th that orange thing in that picture on the left, that's a yogurt made from yams. So you can, you can make all these healthy swaps and it's delicious. So you don't have to suffer. <laughs> it's not like just eating like, uh, you know, kale all the time. So these are key nutrients that your eyes need to stay healthy. Lutein, zeaxanthin, astaxanthin. Those are usually the ones that you find in so-called eye vitamins. Beta carotene, and I know in this picture it has the carrots because that's, you know, that's what you find in stock images. Um, and carrots do have beta carotene and carrots are great food. I'm just saying for me, when I drink my carrot juice, um, and especially when I cook carrots and I would eat a whole dish with cooked carrots, my blood sugar went up to like 250 or 300. So I had to stay away from them. And maybe I put one carrot in my dish, but I don't eat a whole bunch of them at the same time. Antioxidants. Vitamin, all the B vitamins are important. Vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, zinc, and omega-3 fatty acids. So those are all really important foods. Basically, the first uh, three help with macular health, help with that sharp color vision, the day vision, the beta carotene, the vitamin A, um, which is you know converted to vitamin A, help with our night vision um, because they uh, nourish the rod cells in our eyes. They're basically a precursor to rhodopsin, which is the, the covering of the rod cells that give us peripheral and night vision. So, you know, all these things are important. And if you read a rainbow diet and you check your blood sugar, you get the benefits from those foods and you also keep your blood sugar balanced, right? That's really important. And so we are often deficient in omega-3 fatty acids. That was certainly for me the thing. I tracked it for like a week, everything I ate. And I used an app called chron Chronometer or Chronometer not with an H, it's a C-R-N-O-N, as a chrono without the H, that where you can put in everything you eat and it spits out all the nutrients that you're getting. It's really helpful. It's a little annoying, but if you do it for a week, you get a pretty good idea. Chromium, magnesium, zinc, B vitamins, and protein. So I supplement with some of these. I do supplements with omega-3s in addition to eating lots of chia and flax. I do um, supplement with magnesium and B vitamins, zinc, and I also supplement with protein powder. So, and these are herbs and spices that help balance blood sugar. Berberine can actually be as effective as, as um, metformin, the prescription drug for diabetes. Cinnamon is great. I put cinnamon in my chia pudding, olive leaf extract, bitter melon, bilberry, and guma, which is a Australian um, plant. I don't know how to get that, but this is everything I found that can help. So I usually, for me, it's usually berberine, cinnamon. Those are the things I use the most. So I actually have some recipes that, I, that everybody in my Clear Vision Club gets these recipes. If you're a member of my Clear Vision Club, this is a green smoothie recipe. I have this, what I call omega-3 power porridge. That is the one I make and I have a recipe for that. And then this is my called my ABC spinach salad because it has all the key in, in vitamins in there. It has the A vitamins, the B vitamins, the C vitamins. Um, so it's, it has it has some um, bell peppers in there, some pine nuts, some spinach because mushrooms because they're all edamame, um, chickpeas, which are all high in these um, in vitamins. And by the way, the dark leafy greens, kale, spinach are really high in lutein, zeaxanthin, that I vitamin. And they're also high in glutathione, which is a really powerful eye anti, it's an antioxidant, really good for eye health. Um, and then I also have a recipe for a green goddess dressing. And that includes um, all the vitamins A, C, and K. K vitamin is important that you can actually absorb vitamin D from the sunlight. Also the avocado is high in glutathione. And then this is one of my favorite things is my, my coconut coins. I call them coconut coins. So they have a little bit of higher level of fat. So it doesn't replace a healthy salad, but it's a nice little treat. And that um, MCT in the coconut also helps you digest omega-3s better. And so here's basically a picture of me before and after. I think the whole slideshow for some reason went out of order, but this is basically me before I did. Um, and I already lost some weight becoming a vegan. So I had already lost some weight before I started working with Rita Marie. But at that point I hadn't balanced my blood sugar levels. And then you see me on the right after, you know, changing my diet and really um, 
creating a diet that is optimal for me, that is based on my blood sugar levels and not just on what they people think you should eat or what they put on Instagram for the superfoods. And I promise you that I would share with you how you can, if you don't want to prick your finger a lot with that, that meter on the left there is from Walmart. It's a cheap $9 meter. The strips are also very inexpensive, but it adds up and you have to prick your finger and you bleed a little bit each time. And so what I recommend is getting a so-called continuous blood glucose meter that is really uh, makes it convenient. You can scan your blood sugar at any time with a smartphone. And um, here's a little video of me um, putting it in. And I don't know if you can hear the sound. So let me try playing this video. I've actually recently tested another blood glucose, a continuous blood glucose meter called Dexcom, um, which I found highly annoying and it broke after one and a half days. So they're sending me a new one. I will test it again, but that one gives you the average, but you can't really scan your blood sugar. So it's a little bit different. And I think it's more developed for actual diabetes. People, because the first time I put it in and my blood close, glucose was totally wrong. That thing measured it wrong. And it said 128 and I double checked it with a finger prick and it was like 95. And it has an alarm so loud, like an amber alert. Like I literally, like I thought like, oh my God, what happened? Like I thought some panic alarm, but I think it's important for diabetes. If you have diabetes one or you actually have an insulin pump for those cases. So I don't, I personally didn't like that one, but I do like the Freestyle Libre from Abbott. Um, here's the thing, you need a prescription in the US to get it. In Canada and Europe, you can get it without a prescription directly from their website. And it makes it super easy. It lasts for 14 days. And the nice thing about it, you see your blood uh, glucose between meals when you sleep. You know, you get basically, you get complete feedback, not just a few times where you prick your finger. So I really like it. So let me play this video. And I don't know if it, it, if it plays, but let's, let's see. So I don't talk in this video. It basically, I just go, oops. Oh, good. what happened? Sorry, let me try that again. Um, I'm going to show how to do this. Apologize. So it's a box. It comes in because people are like, oh my God, that hurt. I don't like to put something in my body um, that is painful. I can actually turn the sound down a little bit. So you obviously use an alcohol swab to, you know, you have to clean out your skin and you put that one usually in the upper arm, like here. And um, you have to clean your skin. And then you... I do a second one. Okay, sorry, this is taking a little bit longer. So I want to make sure I show you that it's really not a big deal to do this. And by the way, if you have a doctor like a chiropractor, um, you can order it from a website. Um, and then you just, you can tell, I, my chiropractor, I don't have a doctor here, but I have a chiropractor. And he didn't know about this. I said, just tell them I have metabolic syndrome. And he did. And you, so it's really, you, it, you don't really have to go to an actual, anybody with a doctor title can really be the one that, that um, I think they call them or fax them and they just have to say, um, so here, I put the thing in there and I press on my arm and you, it's like a little stamp, like a post-it stamp. You press it in, plop, and it really, it's a needle so thin, like a hair, super, super thin. So let me stop my screen share. So it's a really super thin, uh, it's not even a needle. It's so like a hair. And if, it, if you would pull it out, you couldn't get it back in. It's so skinny. You really don't feel a thing. So I don't want you to feel discouraged. But this is really interesting to do for all of you here. So I hope this was interesting. Let me see if there's anybody on Google, uh, not Google, YouTube, who has, oh yeah, I see lots and lots of comments. Okay. Um, all right. Let me see if there's any questions. Okay. Susan says, I love this talk. Wow. So much to learn. Yeah. This was really, really for me, like, you know, I always prided myself as eating. In fact, I actually got co-workers when I used, but back then when I first, um, uh, when I worked in an office before I, you know, did this full time, um, people would say, you eat so healthy. And I would eat a salad a couple of times a week. And in America, everybody thinks you eat so healthy if you eat a salad, but I would also eat burgers and fries and pizza and pasta. And I would eat cookies more than one. <laughs> my grandparents had a bakery. So I grew up eating, my mom would bake a pie every day. We would eat you know, sugar every day, like my whole family. And then guess what? My grandmother died of, uh, had a stroke, dementia, heart disease. My dad died of cancer. My mom has high blood pressure. My whole family is pretty much sick, except for my sister and I, because we realized, thank you. Thanks to Dr. Rita Marie, who really um, was the, my mentor who really, and she, how did I find out about this? 
So sometimes when people say, oh, you do a free class, this is a little rant, I'm sorry, but this is a little rant. So I do free webinars, I say, your sales pitch, you know, when everybody does a free class, we it's a lot of work. And yes, we offer a solution. And I'm so grateful for Dr. Rita Marie, because I think she, I don't know how I found her, but it must've been an ad on Facebook or Instagram. I don't remember. And thanks to her, I was made aware of this problem because I had no clue. And I would have gone down the same rabbit hole like my mom. And I would have gotten the same diagnosis, cataracts, high blood, and my blood pressure was already high. So I already knew something wasn't right, but I also didn't know what to do about it, right? I, I was eating clean as I thought. I was uh, you know, already avoiding oils, but I had I didn't realize how these foods affected my blood sugar and how high some of these healthy foods like fruit affected my blood sugar. I didn't know. I had no clue because I didn't feel anything. I didn't feel dizzy or I didn't get, actually one thing I did notice, I used to get headaches pretty much every day. And when I did that, my headaches were gone. I hadn't had any headaches in four years. So that was not that was one of the other things I noticed because headaches were a common problem for me, sometimes migraines, and I would take ibuprofen a lot. And I just thought it's stress-related. And of course, stress is a contributor, but the blood glucose was really the big needle mover for me to not ever have a headache again. Um, so I don't, you know, Rita, this is a good question. I don't make all of them myself. I do buy, but sometimes I just put uh, vinegar on top. And sometimes I do eat a little bit of oil. I'm not saying I'm completely oil-free, but I do my best and I look at ingredients. So when I buy a pasta sauce, I either buy one without oil, I make my own or I buy one where oil is kind of like one of the lower ingredients. But like Rouse is, for instance, a pasta sauce I used to love. And I look at, and they have, I think the second ingredient is olive oil. So when you look at the amount of fat, you know, it's, it's, you, you have to get savvy. If you buy, if you buy existing, like, you know, foods in the supermarket, you have to become one of those people. And that's why improving your vision and reading the small print is helpful. You have to become one of those people that stand in the aisle and, and reads the label, right? And I do that. It's, and it's time consuming. But at some point, you know the brands that you like. For instance, I like um, Trader Joe's says these, they used to have this yummy fresh almond dressing. They don't have that anymore. And the fat in that was almond butter. And um, another one, and then I realized they had a dill dressing that has canola oil. So I'm not buying that one. But then I have another one that has a little bit of olive oil that I like. It's a vegan Caesar dressing. And yes, but I also put very little dressing on my salad. I don't drench my salad in, um, in dressing. Yeah, but I'm not saying that I'm, you know, that I, you know, I eat some chocolate, but when I buy chocolate and I, they don't have the Montezuma Absolute Black anymore, Trader Joe's, which has no sugar, didn't have sweetness, nothing. Love that chocolate. They don't have it anymore. Damn Trader Joe's. Um, so now I found another chocolate that has the lowest amount of sugar that I could find because I honestly don't have the time to make my own chocolate. So, um, what do I, okay, Rose, that's a great question. What do I need to do if I already have cataracts? First of all, um, I know you're in my program, so I have a whole training on cataracts, and you want to definitely like de do a detoxification process, um, you know, liver health, um, avoid if you smoke, you know, um, you probably, I used to actually smoke cigarettes, believe it or not. Um, you want to stop smoking, you know, any kind of, you know, you want to do a toxic burden test. There's several, I work with Isabel Yang, she's my personal health coach now. And we do a, a mineral test, we do a hair test, we do a urine toxin test to see what kind of toxins I have been exposed to and do a clear, clear that one out. And you want to follow, follow my protocols, like I, light rest movement, movement is really important. And then again, um, balance, start balancing your blood sugar now. Like look at your A1C, to get that tested, test your fasting insulin, your fasting blood, blood glucose, test your postprandial blood glucose, either prick your fingers, or get one of those, you know, plug in your arm kind of continuous blood glucose meters. I did a year of finger pricking. I actually two years of finger pricking before I ever got one of those stick in your arm. And I don't use them a lot. They cost 70 bucks a pop because unless you have diabetes or earlier to use insulin, your insurance is not going to pay for those. So I use them like, you know, maybe every three months or so I use, and initially I used them a few times in a row and then I got a better feed. But what I like about the continuous ones is that you know, because sometimes, here's another thing I, actually, I forgot to say. So when I worked with Rita Marie, she had us prick our finger 15 minutes after a meal, 30 minutes after a meal, 45 minutes after a meal. 
one hour after a meal and two hours after a meal. That was a lot of finger pricking. And I ate only two meals a day, but there was still a lot of finger pricking. When we wake up in the morning and I found that my blood glucose tends to spike around 45 minutes after eating. Now, if you eat something like in 10 minutes, uh, like now I eat so slow, I might take an hour to eat a meal. Then obviously by the time you finish the meal, it's already, you know, it's so, so that's what it's nice about the continuous one because you scan it and you see it, but you also see if the curve went higher after you scanned it. So you can see um, versus the finger pricking, you only get that moment in time when you actually prick your finger. But I, I would usually eat, prick my finger around, I would set a timer and prick it after 45 minutes after I realized that most of the time, kind of my highest was around 45 minutes. Um, so and after two hours, your blood glucose should be back to what it was before you ate. So that's another indicator. Two hours later, you should not, you should be back to normal. It should be as if you never eaten anything. And that wasn't the case for me initially. So that's another thing that you can um, test out. And that's what's nice about the con continuous blood glucose meters. But again, they cost about $70. I think if you're on Medi-Cal or one of those things, you they can probably get them cheaper. Um, and I don't know what they cost in other countries, but I know in the US you need a prescription. So they make it really hard for you to be a preventive and smart um, person, right? They'll make it as hard as possible. So, oh yay, first time watching you. My, I'm so happy to see that. And I'm looking to the side because I have my other monitor there and in the front I have my Zoom people. Um, Oh yeah, I had no idea that sugars and cigarettes, that's insane. Yeah, um, Ripley, that's true. Olive oil is not a seed oil, but it's a processed food. Any oil is a processed food. The actual original food is an olive. And, a, and oil is already so much more, has so much more fat than an actual olive. So olive oil is already a super highly concentrated form of fat. Same with almond butter. It's way more concentrated than actually eating an almond, right? Because you have that concentrate. Because who eats just one teaspoon of almond butter? Who does that? I don't. In fact, I had to stop buying it because I couldn't stop eating it. Like, you know, I would just eat it out of the jar. <laughs> I'm fessing up. Okay, chronometer is, yeah, Sassy, Sassy put that in. So the chronometer app is uh, actually spelled C-R. It doesn't have an H. That's so not chronologically uh, spelled correctly, but it's like that. I like that app too. It's a really great way to track your, your food. It's a little bit of work, but I did that food tracking for maybe when I worked with Dr. Reed and, Reed and she has that program. She does it once a year, I think. But basically we had a month where we would just be detectives. We would just write down everything we eat. We would track how we felt, uh, blood glucose. Uh, like I said, before, fifth, after eating 15, 30 minutes, we would track all the stuff. And then we knew kind of at that point I had dialed and I can eat a little chia pudding with a quarter cup of blueberries that was safe. And then we had a month where we would stay under 110 after eating. And then we had an, the third month in her program was then about slowly introducing foods that you, you had to eliminate and then you just kept checking. So that's the program. But I did it in 2018. I think you, she changed the program a little bit because it was it was a really committed program. But I was committed. I was the person that's like, I need to get this under control. And I lost all that weight and I feel amazing. I mean, it really, really made me feel younger in many ways. Okay, I got the Kimberly, I got the um, Freestyle Libra and the one I, it's in my bathroom, I don't have it here, but here's the Dexcom, I actually the failed one, I pulled it out and um, the Dexcom you put in your belly and I think it, it uses interstitial fluid, not, not blood. And it was horribly wrong. And I guess you can calibrate it by pricking your finger and then going into the second app that you, and that you need to use two apps. You need a sensor and a transmitter. It's to me, I, I thought this was the worst thing ever, but they're going to send me a new one. So, because this one was broken, I don't even know how to get the transmitter out of this thing. And you put it in your, into your belly fat next to your navel. So you don't put it in your upper arm. And I guess, I think it's good for diabetics because it get, raises that alarm, which I had to turn off because it would just blare would scare me like an amber alert. Um, and the, you can't scan, like with the freestyle Libra, you can scan anytime you want. The only thing with the freestyle is, I think if you have a span of more than eight hours without scanning it, you know, when you sleep, like when you sleep, you kind of want to scan it before you go to bed and when you wake up, because at some point there will be a gap in the curve. There will be, it will, you know, if you, do, if you, you wait too long between scans, more than eight hours or nine hours, then you will have a gap. But by the way, what you can see on this one, I don't know if you can see this, guys. Uh, maybe in front of my blue. 
I don't think you can see it. It's a, it's a little hair, maybe it's something black behind it. I don't know if you can see the little, do you see that little hair? I don't know if you guys can see it. It's so thin. That's the sensor and the same in the freestyle. It's, it's so skinny. So when you put it in, it doesn't hurt. It's not like an actual needle, you know, like when you get blood drawn or something, not at all like that. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Yeah, I like that. You can use kimchi. Yeah, because sauerkraut is fantastic. Oh my God, you don't like it? I actually, um, well, I'm German. I like sauerkraut. And I like, obviously, the raw, unpressurized one that you, Costco has it, actually. Pretty affordable. Okay, you guys, we have to come to a close. I'm going to have a little bit of extra time with my Clear Vision Club community, but all of the rest of you, goodbye. Next week, we will have the blind biohacker on. He has... He's known as um, he's known as a blind biohacker. His name is Victor Mip Mipsov. He's on Instagram and he has shares about his experience with retinitis pigmentosa, a congenital disease he has, and what he's doing to keep his eyesight in optimal shape. And that means optimal, considering that he has retinitis pigmentosa, and what he's doing, um, yeah, to keep his vision as much of it as possible. And I'm excited about that. That's next week. Um, so join me every week. We are live here on YouTube. Follow me here. Subscribe to my YouTube. Click the little bell icon so that you get notified when I go live. If for some reason you missed the link or the email so that you can find me. And um, again, every Wednesday at noon Pacific.